So that's, uh, that's upon us today. And I hope we all deal with it successfully. But, uh, you know, the climate uh, mitigation and climate risk is also an existential threat to, to India and the world. And in both with COVID and with uh, climate change, what it shows us is we all got to work together, Sanjeev. You know, that's, that's what we got to do. That's exactly right. I think uh, you said it aptly. I mean, COVID is upon us and it's uh, wreaking havoc right now in India, the second wave, the second surge. Uh, but, uh, you know, climate change is also not to be forgotten. That's, that's aptly put. Uh, MR, I think it would be a good idea to introduce in diaspora a little bit to uh, those, of, uh, those of the folks uh, who are watching today who may not know a lot about us. Yeah, please. Uh, you're, you're the executive director. I'll let you do the honors. I'll do that gladly. Thank you. Uh, so welcome to the program, everyone, and thanks for joining. Uh, we are looking forward to a very exciting uh, India session of the Indiaspora Climate Summit. Indiaspora is a nonprofit organization founded in 2012, and MR is our founder. Uh, our mission is to position the global Indian diaspora as a force for good. We also serve as a bridge between Indian diaspora leaders and India. And there are three pillars that we focus on. One of them is being a catalyst and a platform for philanthropy and social impact. Another is encouraging nonpartisan political and civic engagement. And a third is fostering entrepreneurship and innovation. This is something that we are now increasingly doing on a global scale. Uh, while we were founded here in America and are very active here, we are also opening an office in India as we speak uh, in the next couple of months. And we have also started working very actively with diaspora in several other countries with large Indian origin populations, such as the UK, Singapore, uh, Canada, and the UAE. Uh, and really looking forward to having this first in diaspora climate summit uh, during Earth Week, just as we are approaching Earth Day. Uh, but MR, you know, I know that one of the, your passion, uh, as, as some of us know, is running networks and building networks of like-minded people. I know one of the other organizations you run is uh, the Corporate Eco Forum, uh, and that's germane to the conversation we are having today. Do you just want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think, uh, Sanjeev, uh, thanks for asking that question. I've been involved in the climate space uh, for about 15 years when I founded uh, the Corporate Eco Forum, which is a group of 70 of the world's largest companies, companies like Amazon and Apple and Disney and UPS and many others to work with their chief sustainability officers to mitigate climate risk, to help reduce greenhouse gases, increase renewable energy purchases and build sustainable supply chains. Uh, and so it's uh, heartening for us to have uh, a climate summit here as well in a very different way. Uh, this is uh, where we hope in diaspora can be a catalyst and a convener, uh, inspire people. We are going to uh, showcase some great inspiring speakers uh, this morning and this evening, as well as uh, collaboration. We're going to talk about how people can collaborate. And finally, as you know, we're going to also have some breakout rooms where all the participants can actually talk about taking action and actually take action, like my good friend Rob Swan will, uh, will tell us in a little bit. So that's a gist of it. I think we got an amazing program and we'll uh, lay out the agenda again in the chat, uh, chat box so you can see all the speakers coming up. But I think without further ado, Sanjeev, I'll let you do the honors and introduce our first uh, keynote speaker of this morning. Absolutely. And the theme of our India session today is how do you prosper in a net zero economy? And for that, to kick it off, we are delighted and honored to welcome our keynote speaker. He will speak on the topic of a paradigm shift, the net zero opportunity for India. He is none other than Satya Tripathi, the Secretary General at the Global Alliance for a Sustainable Planet, and formerly the UN Assistant Secretary General and head of the New York office of UN Environment. Satya, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sanjeev. Greetings, uh, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Based on where you are, um, it's um, a rare privilege for me to be uh, speaking to the um, uh, to fellow Indians across the planet. Uh, and, I, and I deem it a privilege because this is the first time I'm doing it. And I have been uh, at it for a while um, as an international civil servant until um, uh, two weeks ago. 
uh, when I decided to move to the Global Alliance for a Sustainable Planet as its first Secretary General. The, the power of the Indian diaspora, uh, or for that matter, any diaspora, um, is underemphasized mostly. Um, and, and, and it is time we leveraged uh, our strengths um, and showcased the best of us across the planet uh, in support of uh, people and planet. And of course, in that conversation, India holds center stage. Let me explain why. But before I do that, I, I want to acknowledge uh, the amazing champions um, that are um, going to be speaking in different sessions today. Um, I have had the privilege of knowing many of them. Um, and, and of course, at the end of it, you'll be hearing uh, some beautiful music, um, the Earth song from uh, Ricky Cage. Um, and, and, uh, and you will see that the song and the music is as soulful and pure as the people uh, and the thoughts it represents. Let me start by um, talking a bit about where India is in the global context. Now India's per capita emissions are about 1.9 tons, um, as opposed to the uh, ideal average that should be about 2.1 tons per capita. Um, that's what uh, IPCC tells us. So in that sense, Indians are actually performing well. They're, they're under the ideal average that uh, we ought to be at. But the trouble is that we are doubling roughly every nine to 10 years, as has been evidenced in the last decade. So, so with that, we would easily surpass any of the largest emitters, the two ahead of us, that is China and the United States, um, in a few decades, if not earlier. But also the challenge is that, what is it doing to us? What is, um, what is the cost of uh, climate mitigation and adaptation for India? India may not have played a big part um, or even a small part in the challenge that confronts humanity, but India will certainly have to play a critical part in amending all the wrongs that have been done to Mother Earth over the last hundred years or so. And when we talk about net zero, um, many people frame it as a challenge. I frame it as an opportunity. When, when people frame it as a challenge, what they say is that, well, you know, it was never India's problem to solve. That's the, the broader context in which people talk. And, and they would be basically telling the truth that India really didn't contribute much to the global pollution, the, uh, the global carbon budget for a two degree future uh, is about 2,900 gigatons. And uh, we are roughly 300 short of shooting past that milestone in which um, you will not be able to stay at a under two degrees Celsius global warming scenario by the turn of the century. Forget the turn of the century. The World Meteorological Organization a few months ago came up with this latest report, which tells us actually we have a 70% chance of getting to 1.5 degrees of global warming in the next five years. And then that would have a telling effect on countries with coastlines, countries with all kinds of uh, uh, entrenched indicators that actually make it impossible for people to get out of the poverty trap. And of course, we well know being Indians that India has about 7,200 kilometers of coastline and most of the, uh, the impoverished the vulnerable, uh, the poor that depend on uh, um, artisanal and coastal fisheries for their protein needs uh, are all living along the coastline. So when the sea levels rise, and mind you, we're at 415 parts per million of carbon concentration in the atmosphere. Last time we were anywhere near these kind of numbers was 3 million years ago. And at that time, the sea levels were actually 20 meters higher. And of course, people ask you the counter question, the skeptics, so why aren't we seeing those levels of sea, sea level rise? Because this has all happened in a hundred years time, too short a time frame, And of course, you will see all those impacts cascading and we're already seeing them actually. If you look at the Arctic ice shelves, literally breaking apart the size of continental ice shelves and melting 30 times faster than they were in the eighties and the nineties. So the evidence is staring us in our face. Now, what's the opportunity for India? Now, the opportunity is this. 
when people say that I'll get to net zero by 2060 or 2050 or 2045, as is the case of Sweden, it's all great. But um, I have a different experience, unfortunately. I call it greenwash. Because if you look at uh, something that I was involved in in 2015, the New York Declaration on Forests, a lot of big corporations came together and said, you know, we're going to really do something that will be miraculous in five years time, in 10 years time, lots of promises. In 2020, we did um, a study, a lot of partner organizations, of course, coming together. And we found that those prom promises counted for precious little. Um, and, and so when people say that net zero without common measures, without common standards, it is really difficult to understand what people mean by net zero. It's a great conversation. Um, as I often say, the road to nothing is peppered with great conversations. That's what has been happening for the last 30 years in the climate conversations. We've had some great cops and some not so great cops, the conferences of parties, and we produced precious little in terms of results. Now, are these conversations important? Of course they are. They're very important. Countries, uh, stakeholders all need to come together uh, and speak with each other because when we stop speaking, we start fighting. So that's a great thing to have, but we also need to produce action that the planet desperately needs and the planet, our motherland, India desperately needs. And in that, in that uh, Jane was talking a little while earlier about the Dahlberg report that came out uh, just this morning. $95 billion of economic impact for air pollution in India. 2019 um, Lancet report that came out last year tells us that we're losing 1.67 million people. That's 16.7 lakhs. People die every year due to air pollution. Now there's in, in that report, there's hope because they say that compared to the, uh, to the 90s, uh, if you look at it now, we have actually saved 64% people that were dying of indoor air pollution, domestic air pollution. Our mothers and our sisters who get to stay at home and mostly do the cooking in very unhealthy circumstances. That has changed because science has helped. You know, the uh, energy efficient cook stoves, the, uh, the Ujwala program of the government of India that has really engineered a paradigm shift. So there are these examples of we actually doing exponentially well in some of the areas, whereas the other areas we haven't. So what's the opportunity for India here? Now, India, of course, um, has agriculture, which uh, uh, counts for 18% of the emissions. Scientists tell us that by 2030, we'll be at 515 million tons of emissions uh, from the agriculture sector. Now, something revolutionary is happening in India. Uh, if you look at Andhra Pradesh, they're doing something called uh, uh, the Community Managed Natural Farming Program, where the input costs are dropping exponentially and the output keeps increasing steadily over crop cycle, over crop cycle. And then what is happening is that as of today, a million farmers have changed behavior. When we, the so-called wise and intelligent people get around these conversations and, and talk about risks, you know, we forget that there are people whose resilience is this little, who live from one crop cycle to another crop cycle and their entire families and their children, their schooling and their nutrition, everything depends on it. They are willing to change behavior despite the fact that the resilience is this little and ours is this big. So we really need to take inspiration from these smallholder farmers in different landscapes in India, not just Andhra Pradesh, Himachal Pradesh, Sikkim, Maharashtra, Karnataka, and different parts of the states uh, around the country. And, and these numbers add up to almost 3 million farmers that have changed behavior, but that's still a small number. We have 120 million smallholders, 160 million hectares of cropland in India. Imagine what happens when everybody changes behavior. India could actually produce not just the mitigation of the 515 million tons by 2030, but it can also produce carbon sequestration uh, amazing numbers. Because as we know, the soil could hold three times as much carbon as there is in the atmosphere. So if we can do that through sustainable agriculture, through natural farming, uh, and through organic farming as well, although that's a much more expensive option. That could change. Um, uh, Anita talked about uh, the burning of crop biomass and the work that TNC and, and other partners are doing in North India. That could actually change the paradigm if we can find a business model 
where we take all the crop biomass, convert it into bioenergy, you know, biogas, um, compressed um, natural gas or compressed biogas as they call it. Um, and the government has a serious program and we are working with the Ministry of Petroleum and Biofuels on that. And then last but not the least, the 63 million small and uh, medium enterprises in India um, that uh, contribute a lot to the problem, but very little to the solution because nobody is really thinking of them as a part of the solution. They're at best a problem on the fringes or at worst a problem that we can forget about. But it is time to actually respect their contributions to the economy, which is phenomenal, the employment, both in the formal and the informal sector. And if we work with them to aggregate their problems and find system scale solutions, and it's not really rocket science, pick up a few districts, break the back of the problem, find what gives, produce solutions and the resources. And that's why we founded the Global Alliance for a Sustainable Planet. We intend to produce a trillion dollars of development impact in the next 10 years. And we're starting with India. We're working on a $10 billion climate adaptation fund because mitigation is somebody else's problem, honestly. It's the world that has produced the emissions and India cannot be expected to provide the solutions to that mitigation challenge. India should certainly provide solutions to the adaptation challenge because it has to deal with its own problems. The air pollution, the, uh, the unsustainable agriculture, um, the, the ecosystems that are literally uh, disintegrating as I speak. And, and of course, the public health crisis that aids and abets COVID-19 kind of diseases because zoonotic diseases uh, affect those that are much more immunocompromised, which is a lot of people in our own country. So the solutions are there. And when other countries are desperately looking for residual emissions that they can basically, they need somebody else to produce um, the, uh, the carbon sequestration numbers or the mitigation numbers that they can get the offsets for them. India could be at the front of the line producing hundreds of billions of dollars of offsets by both saving its people, its public health, its ecosystems and becoming a resurgent country while of course serving the rest of the world with the offsets. So we have a tremendous opportunity and the diaspora has a, an amazing role to play in it. We look forward to working with you in capitalizing and actualizing that promise. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Satya. What an inspirational opening keynote where you really laid out the problems, but you also tackled the solutions. And uh, I know you've done tremendous work in your role at the UN and now in this new job as uh, Secretary General as well. And what I'd like to do now is move on to our next speaker, our next keynote, where we will uh, hear a, 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 a TED-like talk and then a Q&A session with a dear friend of mine, Rob Swan, OBE as they call him in England. And Rob is a, a dear friend I met several years ago. He's on our advisory board at the Corporate Eco Forum, but he's also become a very good friend. And he's not only the first person to walk to the South Pole and the North Pole, but a uh, little known fact is he also bicycled around India to bring awareness to climate change, which he calls the most dangerous mission in his life. And beyond that, he then decides to save tigers in India. So to demonstrate awareness for that, he puts on a tiger suit and actually runs in the Mumbai Marathon. What an amazing achievement, but it's not, he doesn't stop with just the physical activities. He's this human phenomenon who inspires people as we'll see in his keynote. So back to now to visit with Rob Swan. The Levin, I saw a film about the My name is Robert Swan, and I'm delighted to share our story with you all today. It's a story about doing what you say you're going to do. And at the age of 11, I saw a film about the real explorers who went to the North and South Poles. And I made a commitment that one day I would become the first person to walk to the North and South Poles. And I was just so inspired that at last, maybe one day, I could visit this extraordinary ice kingdom at the bottom of the world, the Antarctic. 
After years of battle to raise money and keep things going, we now head to the South Pole 900 miles on foot, three of us, 70 days on foot, really hard work, no backup, no radios, no way out if we made mistakes. And it was an extraordinary experience to be standing in an area twice the size of Australia and pretty much be on our own with no backup. And after 70 days, we reached the South Geographic Pole. It was a great moment. We were so proud of what we had achieved. And something happened to me walking to the South Pole that really brought me to come and speak to you all today. And my eyes changed color through damage. Our faces had blistered away. The skin came away. We didn't know why. But on return home, we were told by NASA that we'd walked under the hole in the ozone layer. It was discovered while we were walking. So it was a bit of a shock. The ultraviolet rays had come through the hole, hit the ice, bounced back and fried our faces off. And this started me thinking that maybe I should do something about our survival on this planet. First, we had to go to the North Pole. That was the dream. That was the commitment. Walking to the North Pole, you go every step away from the safety of land into the middle of a frozen sea. So every step is away from safety. And after 642 nautical miles, disaster strikes. The entire ocean melts beneath our feet. This had never happened in recorded Arctic history. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. But now, 30 years on from this, you can no longer walk to the North Pole. There is no ice. And we managed with a huge struggle to make it through this breaking ice cap. Last few miles to the pole, we got a bit of luck. The wind changed direction. It gave us a platform to stand at 90 degrees north. We had achieved this mission. And yes, I became the first person to walk to both poles, but I wouldn't have done it on my own. And we flew what I think is still an important flag on our planet. Went back home and was hauled in by our patron, the great Jacques Cousteau from France. He'd helped me and he gave me 30 years ago a 50-year mission. He said, Rob, you've got to make sure that Antarctica, the only place in the world that we all own, that we leave it alone as a natural reserve land for science and peace. And we've been working on that mission now for 30 long years. I believe we should leave one place alone on Earth forever, for science and for peace. We've been on it. We've done it in two ways. One is to involve young people, because after all, they'll be voting in the year 2041. We've been south now with over nearly 4,000 people from 83 different nations. And I'm proud to say, and you'll hear why, uh, that we've involved a lot of young people, business women, businessmen from India. And India is such an important country, A, for our survival on the planet, but B, in 20 years, I'm hoping that India will play a very positive role in the preservation of Antarctica. What we see there is terribly frightening. More and more ice breaking off Antarctica, and I decided that I should go and visit India. Well, let me rephrase that. MR, my great friend, uh, he said, Rob, you've got to go to India. And I said, OK, I'll go. And we decided together that to be relevant in India, I should go around India on a bicycle. Let me tell you that this was the hardest thing I'll never do again. And possibly one of the more dangerous things to go around India on, a, on my own on a bicycle, but it was very relevant to young people at colleges, schools, and universities. I'm very proud of this picture uh, on my way around India on my bike. And as we went round India, we started the second part of our mission, which was, yeah, we need to in inspire young people, but we also need to inspire uh, the use of clean, renewable energy around the world. Because guess what? If we're using more clean, renewable energy, 
No one's going to go and exploit Antarctica. And possibly one will be able to breathe slightly easier in India. Let me just tell you something. After bicycling around India for three years, 6,000 miles, my lungs have only just recovered. And that's something I did about six years ago. So we need to improve the air quality. And as we, I went around India, I came across some of the most extraordinary garbage and rubbish dumps I've ever seen. This one's just outside Bombay. It happens to have the privilege of being the biggest uh, waste dump on the planet. And there I met some extraordinary women. Ladies and gentlemen, I was so proud of these women. They were going into the dumps uh, in Bombay and pulling out various things and then recycling them. And I followed that journey on my bike round India and eventually I was able to deliver some desks to young people who'd never had desks before in the middle, uh, all made of recycled uh, plastic bottles. Very proud of that. Went up to the high in the Himalayas, I saw the source of the Ganges River at uh, Gomuk there. That glacier's melting, only provides 450 million people with water. And going up there, not only was it a very holy place, it really made me think about, uh, you know, even in India, we need to be thinking about the Himalayas actually melting and working with a fantastic team at the Global Himalayan Expedition Team. We've gone up, built an education station only running on renewable energy in Radak, showing young people how renewable energy can work properly. We go up into the Himalayas every year and uh, give monasteries and villages electric light for the first time. We really, really try hard to be positive and show that solutions can actually happen. And this young man had to do his homework after six o'clock at night because we gave him a solar light. And every year, Antarctica is melting more and more and more. More ice goes into the ocean, up comes the sea level. And working with my son, Barney, a great, again, a great uh, friend of MR and uh, his daughter, Zena, it's just great stuff to have families working together. And my son convinced me that this ocean rise may not matter to us so much, in the West, where we can build walls, it matters a hell of a lot to people who can't build walls. So together, we're trying to preserve Antarctica, and Barney's got his mission to inspire young people on solutions. We can't just be angry about the state of our planet, we've got to affect solutions. So together, my son and I would make a journey only surviving on renewable energy to the South Pole, using NASA technology to melt ice and snow, this time led by incredible women, Johanna and Katinka from Norway and Sweden, and off Barney and I went, incredible stuff, and I got 97 miles from the South Pole, fell over, dislocated my hip, which was meant I was out. Barney would carry on, incredible effort by him. And ladies and gentlemen, you know, imagine the disappointment <laughs> at my age especially, uh, to reach, not reach the South Pole when I thought I could. But I've had a brand new hit put back in. And at the end of this year, my son Barney and I will go back on our undaunted journey to the South Pole and finish that mission. Just before that, this November, we're taking more young people, lots of people coming from India, lots of business people coming from India. Please join us back to Antarctica on our ship. So my message is pretty simple, ladies and gentlemen. In order to make any change in life, one must have commitment and one must deliver on one's word. And I hope in our own very small way, we've tried to show that. And I believe these words, I think they're very important. You know, it's not somebody else's problem, it's ours. And I just want to thank MR so much for his terrific support of me and as I say I've never really been the same ever since going around India on the bicycle uh, and I just I want to thank you and wish you all the very very best of luck with your wonderful get together for India today. This is Rob Swan going clear. Wow what an amazing inspiring keynote I hope all of you will share that keynote uh, which will be available on our YouTube channel as well.
And uh, that was uh, something we had Rob record for us to be an inspirational piece, not just for this climate summit, but for the future as well. So Rob, uh, I, have to, I have to embarrass you a little bit as well. Uh, I know you did all these things in India, but you've done so much more also for my family. I know uh, my daughter, Xenia, uh, you spotted her when she was in high school and uh, you took her, uh, encouraged her and took her to Antarctica on the trip. And she was then inspired to really work on marine biology and climate science and uh, has really taken on with Barney the role of being the next generation to actually uh, help, help the world and solve these problems. So thank you uh, for inspiring my daughter and my family as well. Thanks, Amar. And uh, now we got a special guest. I know you're taking another leadership group this November. Uh, and we have someone, a PhD student, Deepika, who was inspired by you to apply and get selected to go with you in November. So we have Deepika here. So let's welcome Deepika, uh, who's now studying in Germany, uh, finishing up her PhD. And she'll be joining you in November. So we brought her on. And uh, she might not want to ask you some questions, Rob, before she decides what, to go. What a wonderful surprise. Hi, Deepika. Um, can't actually see you yet, but welcome. And uh, hi there. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm doing good. How are you? Very well indeed. Nice to see you. And um, I'm really looking forward to November. And uh, far away with any questions you might have. Um, yeah, like I have one question, which I've been also getting from a lot of people. Uh, asking about how this expedition is carbon neutral, because that's how we are um, promoting the expedition. So uh, it would be nice if you could just uh, give a highlight to all the people attending today. Well, I think it's, it's, uh, it's actually a big issue and you have to learn to overcome this issue that people will often say, if you want to save Antarctica, why go there? And uh, that's a good point. But I believe that if all of us who are privileged to go and lucky to go, uh, if we come back with that passion to preserve it, it's worth us going. Uh, as far as our carbon footprint, approximately, it's about 10 tons uh, per person to go there. That's an awful lot. That's, um, you know, seven families average in India. So what we do as a team is to make sure that we plant more trees uh, through my son Barney and his tropical regeneration work. He's replanting some 600 acres of rainforest in northern Queensland in Australia. So through him, we plant a lot of trees, but also we ask each person who comes that they must actually clean up. I don't like the word offset. I like the word clean up. I think if you make a mess, you should clean it up. So we ask each team member to come up with some really good ways of uh, cleaning up their carbon footprint for doing this and hopefully be able to share some of the ways they've done that to give other people, their peers, friends and family ideas of what they can do as well. So it's a huge issue and we're on it. Thank you, Rob. That was an elaborative answer. Um, yeah, I have one more question for you. It's regarding one of the things that you said in one of your interviews. Um, uh, you said young people don't want any more information. They want inspiration. So um, I could relate to uh, uh, this uh, phrase of yours, but like, would you also like to elaborate upon it for the young people who have attended us here today? Well, I think it, it's it's... Uh, you know, my generation, which is incredibly old, um, we didn't have, you know, any of this input from everywhere, you know, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all this stuff that piles in to a young person's head now. I don't know how you actually deal with it, really. Add to that that a lot of people have been on Zoom for the last year. I'm surprised that actually you're all sane. So my view on this is that, yes, we need information, but what we really need are uh, solutions and inspiration. People need to know what they can actually do, not the problem so much, because I think we're all aware of the problem. But I think it's terribly important for people like myself and MR and a lot of people listening to provide you with solutions. Because young people today have every right to be really angry 
with the world that my generation has left you. I'm really sorry, we're trying our best, but you have every right to be angry, uh, Deepika, but being angry isn't enough. It doesn't get you anywhere. So we've got to take that passion amongst young people and turn that into solutions. And the only way to do that is through people like yourself. They possibly, your generation won't listen to me, but they will listen to you. So that's the purpose of you coming with us to Antarctica, to come back with a fantastic story and inspire your peers, your generation on solutions. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Deepika, so much. Again, please, ladies and gentlemen, check out Deepika's blog. Uh, we posted that on the uh, chat box. Also, Rob, I want, before I let you go, some feedback from uh, the listeners. Uh, excellent. Appreciate your presentation. Thanks from Bangladesh. That's Uday from uh, Ajoy from Bangladesh. Uh, we also have uh, Smita that says, what an amazing, inspiring presentation. And uh, you have a lot of kudos, a lot of uh, uh, inspired people here in the audience, Rob. Once again, uh, you're a true friend. And thank you so much for caring about not just the world, but also about India in particular. And uh, we hope uh, that you and I can both, when it's safe, uh, go back to India as well. Let's but get there soon, MR. And thank you so much. And anybody who's listening, good luck to you all. Stay safe and let's send the thought to a lot of people battling in India now. So take care, everybody. Be safe. Deepika, see you in Antarctica. Good see luck. You. Thank you. Thank Bye-bye. You. Bye. Thank you so much, Rob. Uh, what a wonderful, inspiring presentation and a call to action. And on that front, we're now going to move on to our next uh, fireside chat here between two amazing people that I've known for many years. Uh, one uh, person deals with biodiversity and all the issues relating to uh, climate change in India has done yeoman work in India for decades. Uh, and uh, he, again, got a big gift uh, very recently from another dear friend uh, who uh, committed 50 crores, which is uh, a little over six and a half million dollars to his organization. So I won't steal any more of uh, Dr. Kamal Bawa's thunder and Rohini Nilakani's thunder, but I want to introduce both of them here uh, to uh, take on and uh, talk about what's happening at Atri, uh, what this big generous gift from uh, benefactor Rohini means to this organization uh, as to how we move forward. And uh, I want to welcome both uh, Kamal and Rohini to the show. I hope both of you are staying safe wherever you are. But as we said earlier, even though India is going through such a ravaged crisis, the next crisis is upon the entire world, which is climate change, this existential threat. Uh, I leave it to two of you to inspire us and talk about your collaboration. Uh, Kamal and Rohini, please take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amar. And uh, a very good evening to you, uh, Rohini. And, uh, thank you, Dr. Baba. Hope you are well. Uh, thanks. And uh, it's great. I think this is a session of hope and inspiration. And uh, so we hope uh, we will continue this theme. And uh, uh, so Rohini, you have a very large portfolio and that is Rohini Nilekani Philanthropies have a very large portfolio of environmental grants. And we at ATRI uh, certainly very much appreciate your recent uh, 50 core pledge to support our environmental work. And I want to, I want you to tell us what motivates you to devote so much time and resources to the environment. I know you believe in other causes too, and you're supporting those, but I think it's particularly nice to see this focus on environment. And I was wondering if you could tell us uh, what inspires you. Sure, thank you, Dr. Bhava. And in fact, as one of my mentors, uh, you helped me to come to this conclusion that my environmental portfolio was perhaps the most critical um, as I look forward into the future, because I think certainly the people gathered in this audience know very well. And sometimes you only talk to the converted, but more and more people are beginning to understand that the economy which drives so many of us and certainly drives many governments is only a subset of the ecology. 
right? That is very clearly understood that if you are going to build a development model that drains away your natural capital, you're really looking at a very bleak future. So on one side, there's my strategic imperative sort of thinking that environmental issues, especially uh, when combined with climate change related existential challenges are really very uh, important to look at on a long-term basis. But apart from that, just my increasing love for nature itself and my increasing desire, especially to get younger people involved with understanding how interconnected we all are in the web of life and in nature and what a joyful journey of discovery that can be and how that journey of discovery can lead you to understand so many things and yourself change in the process so that your earlier ideas perhaps of what is abundance begin to change, material abundance begin to change. And so for me, for both the personal dimension, the moral dimension and the strategic dimension, my environmental portfolio, including of course A3, which uh, thanks to you I've been involved in for so many years now, um, is not only very important, but also very joyful for me. Well, thanks, uh, uh, and I think uh, your support to A3, uh, and for those of you who really don't know much about A3, uh, A3 works in three primary areas, biodiversity, water, and uh, climate change. And I think your gift is going to allow us to strengthen our programs in several ways. Uh, one, of course, is uh, generating knowledge uh, to address our pressing environmental issues, uh, including climate change, and I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, second, this knowledge in turn will feed into policy design. Uh, as you know, we have recently started a new center for policy research and design. And thirdly, uh, this knowledge will be applied to transform action on the ground as we have been doing for quite a few years or few, uh, I would say decades, a couple of decades uh, with the local community. Through another new center uh, that we started two years ago, Center for Social Environmental Innovation uh, that you again so generously, generously funded. And finally, uh, of course, as you know, we are building uh, India's human resources uh, to tackle uh, important environmental issues. We have a world-class doctor program, uh, interdisciplinary doctor program in conservation and sustainability studies. And I think the support will help us uh, really strengthen that program considerably. I should also mention uh, to, to others uh, that uh, Roini's pledge also includes uh, a matching grant, and we hope uh, we will be able to meet that challenge, a uh, challenge of matching grant. But I think Dr. more Baba, important- if I were to, uh, yeah. Dr. Baba, if you were to tell our audience that uh, since there's a matching grant uh, out there, why should people try to match my challenge grant? Why should people invest in Atri? Do you want to say that in, in a, just a few words? Well, uh, certainly, uh, I think first and foremost, uh, I think any contribution to ATRI will be doubled by your matching grant. Secondly, I think it's more, most important that the important issues we are addressing in terms of the water, biodiversity, and climate change. And I must say, I, I think uh, there are very, very few institutions that are addressing these problems that clearly demonstrate the linkage among these issues. I think we have to realize, I'm sure uh, we are realizing, I, as a matter of fact, due to the pandemic, uh, most notably, that many of our problems, many of our problems arise because we have disrupted our interaction with the nature, with the natural world. 
And climate change is going to compound many of these problems. So if we don't invest in these issues now, few years from now, it will be much more expensive. So I, I, I can go on and on, uh, but I think one of the things we want to do is we want to engage public more widely in some of the things we are doing. And, uh, and I think, Roine, you are very keen on public engagement. And I was wondering you know, if you would like to share uh, with us your views how we can engage public in the efforts uh, towards the environment. Yeah, I, I really think that, as you know, uh, Dr. Baba, I've always believed that in the continuum of Samaj, Bazaar and Sarkar, which is society, state and markets, that I believe that we have to really strengthen the Samaj or the society part of things. Because when you have a strong, healthy society, diverse society, but with good institutions such as ATRI and good leadership, in fact, such as you provide also, if you have many such institutions, we are much more likely to build resilience into our, just into society and to make things to make people much participate and develop agency to solve local problems in context. And I think with the climate change um, challenges, especially that becomes very important to build the societal muscle to solve their local problems in context. Of course, there is the state to look at the larger picture and we must hold the state accountable to helping resolve those larger complex problems and so also markets. We need them to stop creating so many neg negative externalities which have a huge societal cost. So for that, to have a strong society that can challenge both state and markets, I think it is very important that citizens begin to understand that these especially climate change related problems are going to impact us globally but also impact us not just locally, but very, very personally. And so if we get more people to see this and participate in however small a way they can, I think over time that is going to build up in a shift in the mental model about what we mean by development. So for me, a lot of my work is focused on involving people, especially young people as citizens to come together to solve their own problems. And that's why some of the work at ATRI interests me because why you're looking at nature-based solutions, you're looking at conservation-based livelihoods, and that involves wide grassroots participation in creating positive change. So that's what I like to focus on. I mean, we have as a country come, done our nationally determined contribution um, at Paris and especially the NDC three on sequestration, right? Carbon sequestration, we have a long way to go. And I think some of ATRI's solutions, including the project I love on Lantana, where yeah. invasive species such as Lantana, which have overtaken India's Southern forests, ATRI helps the local people living in and around those forests to harvest that lantana and then to sequester it as furniture and some really uh, beautiful other kinds of things that are made with that lantana. And so there's a lot of creativity there when you involve a lot of local people and help them to innovate their way out of problems. So that's what I like to focus on. Well, that's great. And uh, I, I think, uh, uh, our focus uh, is also going to be increasingly towards public engagement. And, uh, and I think one of the really big ambitious projects which is going to allow us to do that is the National Mission on Biodiversity and Human Wellbeing, which is all about uh, how we sort of mainstream biodiversity in the economic development process and how we really demonstrate uh, the efficacy of these nature-based solutions. And I think the nature-based solutions with respect to climate change, I think you mentioned sequestration. Yes. I think it is just so critical. I think it's, it's not only, it has a huge potential in terms of sequestering car uh, carbon, but it is also one of the least expensive ways 
to sequester carbon, but more importantly, restoration of our land and yeah. soils, restoration of a forest, restoration of uh, our agricultural systems, uh, agrobiodiversity, yeah. they have tremendous co-benefits. People will benefit. In fact, one of the goals of the mission is that every citizen of India, every citizen of India will be able to participate and contribute uh, to not only conservation of biodiversity, but also benefit socially, economically. And let me ask you uh, just one more question. I know we have to uh, let the program continue. How do you think uh, in diaspora here, can contribute to this process? Uh, yeah. What are your suggestions to become more involved yeah. in this sort of a, in a very holistic way to deal with the environmental issues, which have very, very clearly tremendous social and economic benefits. And it also addresses the issues of justice and equity. Yeah, before I start and before this goes away, let me just show you. Atri worked with the Shola Trust and the elephant family to take lantana, which is an invasive species of wood, and use the wood of lantana to create these marvelous lifestyle, lifelike elephants based on real animals in the jungle. And I have two of them right here in my garden and they occupy pride of place. So the point I'm trying to make is that um, by supporting such things, the diaspora, we really ask the diaspora to support India in all its uh, development issues and challenges, especially because I'm telling you uh, in India, we are innovating and we are looking to create impact at scale through innovation, through collaboration, to creating digital public goods and really many exciting things in the environment sector and everything else. But if the diaspora, the diaspora people have so much talent and resources, if you could join our hands with us, if we don't get India right, Dr. Baba, I'm sure you'll agree. If we cannot get India right, I really don't see how we can get the world right. Whether it is in public health issues, whether it is in ecological biodiversity conservation issues, or it is anything else because we are soon going to be one fifth of the world's population. We are getting there and we matter and getting India right in terms of justice, equity and environment is going to be hugely important, of course, for India first, but also for the whole world. So all of you, half of your hearts are in India, I think. So reaching out, helping organizations like ATRI, and there are so many other great organizations in India. So I think the diaspora plays a critical role in supporting innovation, impact and scale in India. So this is kind of an appeal. MR does this very well. Indiaspora does this very well. But I really do believe it's not just about your love for India, but everybody needs to help get India right. And we are on the way. We need some help. So that's why I think the diaspora is important. Well, uh, thank you very much, Roini, and uh, over to you, Amar, and thank you again, Amar, for your work. Uh, we very much appreciate it. And one last point uh, to the young people, uh, Amar mentioned, and I'm going to compete here with Robert. Atri also has uh, very good centers in the Himalaya and Western Guards. Come and please work with us. Get in touch with us, and uh, you will have unbelievable experience. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you, Amal. Thank you, Sanjeev. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste, Dr. Bawa and Rohini. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, inspiring and eloquent call to action. So delighted that uh, you could join us today. And what a great example of strategic philanthropy and environmental advocacy. I think both of you are exactly right when you say that all three pillars have to be involved, the markets, the state, as well as nonprofits and society. Uh, so glad that we are able to do this on Zoom. I mean, I know that there's Zoom fatigue and so forth, but there's also tremendous advantages that at a time when uh, uh, COVID is uh, proposing so many serious problems that we are able to still get together and have this discussion on, on Zoom. We are now at the point of the program where we will get into the breakout sessions. 
And this is the point where we actively invite all our participants to engage and to discuss. Uh, but before I get to that and talking about the breakout sessions themselves, let me just tell you a little bit about what's at the other end. So we will have breakout sessions of about 20 minutes, after which, and there's three of them, after which we will reconvene in the main room and all of these uh, logistics will be taken care of by my colleagues. We are going to reconvene in the main room after 20 minutes, after which we have an exciting agenda still left to come. So we will have a summary of the breakout sessions, following which we are going to have a panel discussion on India tomorrow, perspectives from climate philanthropy. After that, there's going to be a talk from Arjun Devecha, who is the founder director of the Devecha Center for Climate Change about driving institutional change for climate action. And we'll cap it all off with a performance by the Grammy Award winner, Ricky Cage, who is also an environmentalist. So stay tuned at the other end of the breakout sessions as well. But for the breakout sessions themselves, there are three of them and you can select any of them that you wish. And again, this is a time for active participation. One of them is on biodiversity and livelihoods, which is going to be chaired by Anita Schwartz, who is the India Development Director of the Nature Conservancy. There's another one on business and climate change, which will be chaired by the Chief India Officer Hisham Mundal at the Environment Defense Fund. And lastly, there is counting the cost of air pollution which will be chaired by Jane Burston, who is at the Clean Air Fund. She's the executive director there. So my colleagues will uh, now start the breakout rooms and you can select any of them. Some of my colleagues will be behind in the main rooms. Uh, if any of you have any specific questions, there are no discussions going on in the main room. So we really encourage you to join the breakout sessions now and reconvene in about 20 minutes. Thank you all. Sanjeev, uh, once again, how do you lead the breakout? You can, uh, you breakout can, you can scroll down. You can scroll down on the box that's on your screens right now. And as you scroll down, you will see three breakout rooms. You are invited to join any of them. Thank you, Sanjeev. And now we'll listen to some music. In the It's a musical expression of my journey towards the light. It is everyone's journey. We are all looking for that light. We call it love, we call it peace, we call it happiness, we call it success. But we are searching for something beyond. And that state of beyond is what I call Shivoham. And that's why the album is called Shivoham The Quest. We will start a conversation, exploring our own journey towards the light. In fact, I dedicate the whole album to seekers of the light everywhere and to the teachers that guide their path. I brought together not just the ancient verses in Sanskrit, but the Indian ragas with Gregorian chants, with sort of almost cafe French music, with a sort of an old English folk with the King singers, or with the Soweto Gospel Choir. But what you find is that there's so many commonalities across the messages between all these different cultures. All of us are seekers in some way, shape or form. Be the change you wish to see in the world. And this is our chance to be that radiant symbol of light ourselves. Three movements, 12 songs. Here's 90 minutes of music. Go on this journey with me. Let's all find Shivoham. 